Welcome to the Transform My Dance Studio podcast, powered by the Dance Studio Owners Association. Over the next eight weeks, we are thrilled to be welcoming the one and only Hilary Parnell as our guest host for a brand new series, Plies to Profits. Hillary is the owner of Academy for the Performing Arts in North Carolina, and this very special series will give you an inside look into how Hillary has grown her dance studio as she shares her tips on building a million dollar dance studio. In this season, Hillary will be dividing into how she delegates tasks effectively, her less but better philosophy, how to bring in more revenue with less output, building community in your studio, and so much more. Before we get started with today's episode, make sure to register for our free online training, the Studio Growth Masterclass, where Clint Salter will be sharing breakthrough strategies for achieving record student attraction, enrollment, retention, and studio growth. Grab all of the details at dsoa.com forward slash studio masterclass. After the Studio Growth Masterclass, you'll have a clear growth strategy for the next year. We guarantee it. That link again to register for this free training is dsoa.com forward slash studio masterclass. Welcome to the final episode in the Plies to Profits podcast. I'm Hillary, and it has been my absolute pleasure to take you on this journey through all the mistakes that I have made, all the lessons that I have learned, and all the things I've done, mostly by accident, that did end up actually working out really well for me over the past 18 years that I've owned my studio. I know for me, I usually have to hear something a few times before it really sinks in, so I'm going to use this last episode to go back and recap the whole series so far. I'm going to hit on all the highlights and remind you of the things you might want to go back to and listen again. And before we dive in, I just want to remind everyone that you don't really know something unless you are doing it, right? Think about that. You don't really know something unless you are doing it. So this is for all you cynics out there, everyone who thinks, yeah, yeah, I tried that, it didn't work, or yeah, yeah, I know, I know all that, but are you doing it? And it's for everyone who was just like me the first few years I owned my studio. I was young, I was egotistical, and overly confident. I could not be told how to do anything because I had to learn it for myself. I had to prove myself. When in reality, if I have any lesson I can pass along to the next generation of studio owners, it would be that you should accept help. If I had joined a group like the DSOA and listened to all the people who have already done it, already made the mistakes, and already figured things out, I would have saved so much time and energy and money, and I would have just been open to accepting that I didn't really already quote-unquote know anything. So as we go through all of this stuff all over again, try to keep an open mind. If you hear some good ideas give them a try. If you hear something that you maybe tried once, but it didn't work out, maybe try it again, but tweak it a little. Since the last time you tried it, it's possible that your audience may have changed. Your marketing strategies may have changed. I mean, you probably have changed. And the right combination of the things that have changed might have an entirely different outcome than the last time you tried it. One of the coolest things about being an entrepreneur is that you have the ability to try new things. You have the power to decide what your studio is going to offer and how you're going to offer it. The problem is that sometimes we take advantage of that power and do all the things willy-nilly and everything can ultimately fall apart. So even though you don't technically have a boss, having a team and systems that act as a checks and balances can really keep you on track and keep you focused on your bigger picture. Remember, you don't want to jump in and try every new shiny idea without a plan. That being said, let's go back to the very beginning of this podcast series, how it all got started. In the first episode that aired on November 11th called Delegate Better and Get More Done, 
We talked about how important it was to prepare your studio for all the profit you're going to make. We talked about how it's impossible to take on any new, big, or even small project if you are already overworked, overstressed, and don't have a team behind you helping you succeed. So how do you do that? How do you get your studio running so smoothly that you don't have to be involved in the day-to-day stuff and so that you can work on your business instead of in it? Well, it's going to take some work, but it starts with systems and getting your studio running outside of your head. Imagine if something happened to you, an accident that put you in the hospital. Could your studio run completely without you? Or even something less dramatic. What if you want to have a baby? And what if you want to take an acceptable maternity leave? Or even better, what if you wanted to go on a vacation for more than a few days? Could your studio survive or even thrive without you? The key to being able to do this is to systematically take everything that you do out of your head and create the systems for other people. It's not super difficult, but it can be really time consuming. So don't waste any time. Get started today. Start systemizing everything. But that's not enough. That will help you find some time, sure. And you won't be in charge of the day-to-day stuff, but you won't fully have a team supporting the growth of the studio until you bring them on board. In order to do this, it's important to have a mission statement and studio values that can help guide them in decision making. It's one thing for your team to be able to order toilet paper or enroll a student without you, but it's entirely different for them to be able to make difficult decisions in your absence. If they all understand what drives your decisions, then it can become something they can do because they know they'll make the same choice that you would. So if you are having team issues or feel like you can't leave the studio without it burning down, then go back and listen to this episode and start bringing your team together to give you the time you need to bring your studio to the next level and get your life back. Next up, In the episode called Work Smarter, Not Harder in Your Dance Studio, we really broke down the big important systems that make the biggest impact on my studio. Once these systems were in place, I felt the biggest relief of responsibility. My team started working more cohesively and I could be away from the studio more. So what were they? I'll recap them quickly. The first one seems a little silly, but it's our annual calendar. Once a year over the summer, we unload every single thing we're going to do for the next year onto a big paper desk calendar. Having this map of our entire year allows us to be very deliberate in the choices we make and not make choices on the spot that can cause unnecessary chaos. The next two are the 11-step enrollment process and the six-week onboarding system. I more or less use the ones available to us in the DSOA, but if you're not a member, having a very specific set of steps for enrolling and onboarding new students is hugely important. I mean, think about it. It's the one thing that happens every day that is necessary for the growth of your business. Figure out a way to make this a system that runs like clockwork, and you'll never have lost sticky notes or dropped leads, or be dealing with really poor trial conversion again. And finally, we all know that we're creative types and we can be pretty all over the place. We like to try new things and bounce between the fun stuff and the businessy stuff, but to be consistent and help keep us on track, the most important system I have found is the 90-day plan. This is pretty much one of the foundations of the DSOA and the most important system that I've implemented. Essentially, it's a form that you fill out every three months that outlines your goals and your to-do lists for that short period of time. The key here is actually sticking to it, keeping it out and in sight all the time and referring back to it daily. If you have a great idea or want to try something new, it needs to fit within your 90-day plan or table it until next quarter. If it doesn't fit there, you table it till next year. You would be so surprised how often you find yourself wanting to put everything on hold for a new wacky idea, only to realize that you didn't have the time or resources to pull it off. 
So head back to episode two that aired on November 18th, where I really break all that down a lot more and explain why less is better is one of Clint's favorite mantras. Next in episode three, called 10 Ways to Create a Ride or Die Culture, we talked about that revolving door. How sometimes it can seem like you're doing a ton of work to get people in the door, but you're losing them just as quickly to high school dance teams or soccer or cheerleading. I explained how I realized that the key for me was to make everyone feel like they're really part of the studio the same way my competitive kids do. I realized that retention from year to year in our company was almost 100%. And it wasn't because they are diehard athletes. It was because they had friends. They had made memories. They had become part of our family. One way my studio drastically increased retention was to make as many people as possible feel like they're part of that family. And we did it, among other ways, through a community performance group. So go back and listen to that full episode to see all the different ways we made almost everyone in the studio feel like they're part of an inside group, and we increased retention across all the departments. Uh, That episode aired on November 25th, so go check that out if you're looking to increase the community aspect in your studio. And then next up in the fourth episode called Your Dance Studio's Secret Weapon, We talked about my most profitable revenue stream I have all year, the recital. Now I'm warning you, if you go back and listen to this one, uh, it aired on December 9th, keep in mind that whole thing about having an open mind. (laughs) In order to have the most profitable recital, you might need to let go of some of the things you love, or at the very least, figure out a way to make more money to pay for them. In that episode, we talked all about the ways to keep your recital super simple to maximize your profit. We don't have fancy backdrops or fancy props. We don't give away recital tickets or t-shirts, and we usually make enough money to cover most of our expenses over the summer. We also broke down and talked about how to maximize all of your micro revenue streams like tights and costumes and programs and yearbooks and tickets. So if you're looking for ways to increase your recital profit, then go back and listen to that episode on December 9th. All right, so the next one aired on December 16th, and it is called Surefire Ways to Boost Your Studio Revenue Today. This one was super long and jam-packed with information. If you're going to re-listen to any of the episodes, I suggest this one for sure. I talked at length about five smaller things and one really big one. The first five were merchandise, parades, rentals, birthday parties, and master classes. If you don't already do all of these things at your studio, maybe you got some new ideas for projects to start in the new year. And if you do already do some of these things, hopefully I gave you some tips on how to capitalize on them. Then we talked a lot about how it's possible that you are losing a ton of money on your competitive program. And even if you don't have a competition team, you may have a group that is considered elite at your studio. You could be losing tons of money on them and not just on the obvious things like hotels and extra rehearsals that you're not charging for. Um, The big reveal was that it's quite possible you are losing money every single month on their tuition. We like to think that it's because, you know, just because they are paying a lot of money that they're making us a lot of money, but in reality, they are probably paying so little per hour that they are costing you more money than they are making you. And if you want to know the details on how to figure all that out and ways you can avoid making that big mistake, then definitely check out that episode and um, the one that was on December 16th. And just make sure you've got some time, because not only is it a long episode, uh, but it requires a whole lot of math and calculations and fun stuff like that, so it could take a while. The next one was also a doozy. Uh, When I read back over my notes, I was like, whoa, 
That's a lot. So I hope it wasn't too much to take in in one episode, but it's all really important stuff. That episode that aired on December 23rd, right before Christmas, was the five biggest money makers your studio could be missing out on. We talked a lot at first about how some people actually feel uncomfortable making money and ways to think yourself out of thinking that way. We talked about how it's actually being a responsible business owner and mentor to allow yourself to make a profit. Then we talked about the difference between profit and markup and how to make sure you're using those words accurately. Um, We dove into price structure and how I realized by doing some fun calculations that I was actually losing money by encouraging dancers to take more than one class. We talked about how unlimited pricing could really be hurting you. And we talked about how a simple $2 price increase could equal thousands of dollars to your bottom line without doing a thing. The cool thing about that episode, when I listened to it again, is that it's all about making slight changes to your pricing structure that could mean serious money. I mean, even though we're talking about revenue streams, you want to make sure you're maximizing your most obvious revenue stream first, right? That monthly tuition. And then in the last episode, which aired on December 30th, the last one of the year, we unpacked eight, yes, eight different big things you can do to take your studio and your profit to the next level. Now, these are really big things, new, bright, and shiny things. (laughs) These are things you only want to do if you have already prepared your studio for profit and put your systems in place. You've gotten your team on board, you have high retention in all your departments, and you have that really profitable pricing structure in place. Then, and only then, will you have the time and energy and resources to dedicate to the big projects like these. So when you're ready, here are eight new revenue streams that we talked about in the episode on December 30th. Number one, You could package your curriculum to sell to other dance studios. If you have a super impressive pre-school dance program, package it and sell it. If you have a great hip hop program that um, you have nicely organized for your staff, you can package that and sell it. Selling business to business is a whole different type of business that could really step you into the next level. Number two, If that's not something you're interested in, you could take that really awesome program and introduce it into local preschools or elementary schools in your area. So creating a program where you send a teacher and your clients are in their school and using that space. That option is great if you um, maybe are running out of space in the afternoon or you rent space in the evening but don't have space during the day. You can take your program to other locations and um, really capitalize on those students that are already there. Number three, uh, you could start your own aftercare program. This, I said, was the one that I'm working on for 2020. I hope to have it running over the summer. We will have a van and pick up kids from local elementary schools and bring them back to the studio where they can do their homework and have a snack and either go into classes or wait for their parents to pick them up after just doing some uh, fun activities. That would be a huge revenue bump for anyone if you can figure out all of the logistics. Um, Number four, you can start your own daytime preschool play space or arts club to fill that daytime space that is sitting empty. Um, Again, I have a a full uh, half-day academic preschool that runs um, year-round, actually, too, which is the other added bonus of that. Um, Other studio owners have filled their space with similar programs, and they work great if you have the resources and a staff member uh, who can do that. Number five is sourcing your own line of merchandise from China. Um, or, or anywhere really. Um, but we have a great, uh, resource, Christy Ellis 
who is a coach in the DSOA, actually takes studio owners on trips to China to find out more information about finding their own um, factory to work with, and you can make your own merch to sell in your own studio boutique. Anything from t-shirts and sweatpants to socks and dolls and um, shoes and even costumes. So if that's something you're really interested in, you could uh, do that and really cut out the whole middleman when it comes to buying merchandise. Um, Number six is adding an adult program. And I guess conversely, if you are an adult studio, adding a kids program. Um, The idea here is that it is not just adding an adult tap class or, you know, one adult ballet class, but really honing in on that market and advertising and having enough classes to call them their own program. Um, That's definitely a market that can be tapped into. Number seven, we talked about bringing your own dance class photography and or videography in-house. So that means rather than hiring a photographer to come take your dance pictures and they give you a small cut, you would hire a photographer to just come take the pictures and you would process the, the entire order and all of that and you would give the photographer the small cut and you keep the bigger portion. Um, if you'd like it, more information about that, I have um, a website available to help. It's www.dancephotopro.com. Um, that's something that I've been doing for the past 10 years and uh, find it a hugely lucrative revenue stream. I since have gotten pretty good at the photography piece of it, so I don't even pay a photographer. And we're able to use all of the equipment that we have in-house for all of our marketing shoots. Um, I do senior pictures for my senior graduating seniors as a gift to them. Um, I do fall and spring pictures for our academic preschool kids. Um, and we're able to always do audition photos and headshots and things like that as well because it's all in-house. So just some benefits to that. Um, and number eight is buying your building, um, which enables you to have real estate investments. So you know, don't forget that your own rent back to yourself could be a revenue stream. So you want to look into that. I'm not an expert in that field, but we do own our own building and pay rent back to uh, an LLC that we have. And it is hugely profitable because we will never have a raise in our rent. Um, It's been the same since we've been in our building for the past eight years, which has been wonderful. So if you're ready to learn more about any or all of those, then go back and check out that last episode in the series. It is packed with tons of great ideas, some that my studio does, others that I know other studios do, and some that I'm planning to do soon. I had also mentioned that I would touch on the profit first model. So before we wrap up, I want to talk a little bit about that. Profit First is a book written by Mike Michalowicz, and it's become somewhat of a movement among entrepreneurs. The concept is simple. Take your profit first rather than at the end of the month or the year, because our human nature is to spend what we make and leave very little left over. If you're in the beginning stages of your business and you're still in the hole every month, you might think it sounds insane to start paying yourself when you can't even keep the lights on. Or even if you're a well-established studio, you may only take distributions when there is money left over in the checking account. The whole principle behind Profit First is that we as humans will psychologically make it work if we take out the profit first. Take our cut before we pay bills. At the end of the month, we may not push ourselves to call those five new leads if the only outcome is that we get to make the money. But if we've already moved the profit out of the checking account and those five new students are going to pay the electric bill, we'll probably make those phone calls and do what it takes to make it happen. Before I even read the book, I had done something similar, sort of a diluted version of this. But it had made a huge difference in how I perceived our cash flow. So we pay our salaried employees twice a month and our hourly employees once a month. 
That means two times a month I would stress over whether or not I had enough in the bank to make payroll. Now, sometimes it was truly just a timing issue, whether or not we had enough to cover it, but sometimes I really wouldn't have enough in there and I would take a later paycheck myself so that everyone else could get paid on time. That just is always an accounting nightmare, so you want to avoid that as often as possible. So eventually I decided, rather than stress about those big chunks coming out twice a month, I started moving our payroll money to a separate account immediately after the credit cards were processed and the deposit hit our checking account. So typically on the third of the month, I would move over the total amount I needed for the whole month of payroll, both payroll periods, and just leave it there. I would inevitably forget about that account because I can't check that one on my phone and the money was gone. My payroll company processed all of the checks from that account and I wouldn't even think about it again for the rest of the month. So now when I look at the checking account in the middle of the month, it's not inflated by that payroll money that I was supposed to save until the end of the month. I see exactly what we have left, and subconsciously, it kind of kicks me into gear to step it up. But if that extra you know, $40,000, $50,000 was sitting in the checking account throughout the month waiting for that last paycheck, it can cloud your judgment. It can make you think that you have more money than you really do and almost force you to make poor choices. So the profit first model is essentially the same thing. It takes the money out of the way. It forces you to make decisions based on what's left over. If you haven't read the book, it'll change your life. You can even find Profit First accountants who understand the model and will help you start. Basically, you start small and eventually you build up more and more. And it helps you also save money in other buckets like for taxes or for upgrades and things like that. Most importantly, it helps make sure you never go a month without a paycheck ever again. You deserve to live with a consistent income. So there have been two common threads throughout this entire series. One has been all about the fear of making money or taking risks and and being afraid to make a profit. That somewhat taboo idea of being successful and how I've overcome it over time. Remember, your time and expertise is worth a lot of money, and it's not greedy or unexpected that you should be paid for those services. The second idea is that every one of these ideas won't be a good fit for your studio. And just because something worked for me or the studio across the street doesn't mean it will work for you. And that's okay. I have tried so many things over the years that I've decided are not a good fit for my studio, and I've learned not to go after every new shiny idea that I come across. Not only would I go completely crazy, but all of our programs would suffer and nothing would be successful. So really, as you're going through this series and getting all of these new ideas, be careful which ones you land on and only try the ones that really speak to you. They should be something that fits your core values, something that you're excited and passionate about, and something that you have the time and resources to accomplish. So that's it. It's been so fun. I really hope to meet some of you wonderful people someday. I look forward to chatting with you all in the group and learning from you and helping you where I can. I'd love to officially thank Clint for this super cool opportunity and say how grateful I am for the whole team at DSOA and the Inner Circle. Being a part of this community has truly changed my path for the better, and I can't wait to see what the next chapter brings. I'm Hillary, and this has been the Plies to Profit series on the incredible Dance Studio Owners Association Transform My Dance Studio podcast. The doors are now officially open for applications to the most comprehensive dance studio growth program in the world, the Dance Studio Owner's Inner Circle. The Inner Circle is for the dance studio owner who is serious about taking their dance studio to the next level. Just one of the biggest game changers that makes the Inner Circle so amazing is that members get full access to our dance studio dream team, our hand-picked coaches and experts who are literally the best in the world at what they do. 
Throughout the year, on both our weekly calls and our retreats, you'll be working directly with coaches and experts who are specialists in every area of your dance studio. As a dance studio owner, this is the ultimate program that guarantees massive growth in your studio. Check out dsoa.com slash inner circle for all the details you need to join this extraordinary group of dance studio owners.